In our Bible study today, we're going to be focusing upon a very hot topic, very controversial. I oftentimes call these types of Bible studies biblical hot potatoes. But the title of our, our Bible study today is, Are My Past, Present, and Future Sins Already Forgiven? I hear that oftentimes with many notable speakers, many notable Christian leaders, and it sounds so wonderful to the ear to hear that through the cross of Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the Savior, when you come to Christ and repent of sin and receive the gift of salvation, all of your sins, past and present and future, are forgiven through Christ. It's wonderful to hear that, but is that really biblical? As always, get a Bible today, a way of taking notes, and we always encourage you to get a highlighter. We will be going through many passages of Scripture today, and I hope you'll keep uh, both high, highlighter and Bible close by. Again, our subject today, are my past, present, and future sins already forgiven? I'm reading out of 1 John chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1 and reading down through verse 6. Here the scripture says, My dear children, I am writing this to you that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments. That person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love Him. That is how we know we are living in Him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. As we always do, let's take a moment to pray together as we go into this time of study. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the integrity of the Bible, and we thank you that it contains the inerrant truth given to us by the Holy Spirit. I pray that today you'll guide us into truth, and that you might help us in this day and age in which we live to live in victory over all sin and live every day for the soon return of the Lord. I pray specifically for those who may be watching right now and perhaps no one has ever loved them enough to explain to them what it means to be forgiven of all their past, of all of their history, of all of their sin and to come to Christ in faith. I pray that you'll help me today to convey the forgiveness of God to them. And when we pray the sinner's prayer, as we always do at the end of our Bible study, give them the faith and the courage and the humility today to do what they ought to do. Anoint my mind and my body and my spirit as we teach and proclaim the truths of God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Many modern churches and denominations, as well as believers, uh, it seems to me, have become very indifferent to sin and have become lukewarm, just as the Bible prophesied would take place in the end time church. Most of you know that I have a great passion for Bible prophecy and eschatology, and much of our channel is devoted to teaching Bible prophecy and eschatology. But would you be surprised if I told you that the book of Revelation actually warned us that the church in the last days, and we find that, and I'm going to read it to you in just a moment, 
the Laodicean church was lukewarm and indifferent to sin. And so I believe we need to understand in the context of Bible prophecy that we should be living aware of the fact that the church in the final moments of human history is going to become more lukewarm, more indifferent, and more tolerant of things that God considers sin. If you have your Bible, go with me into Revelation chapter 3, Revelation and the third chapter, and go down to verse 15. Uh, John, uh, the revelator, given the vision of the book of Revelation by Jesus Christ personally, writing to the Laodicean church, said these words, Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, I know all the things you do that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich and have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also, buy white garments from me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness, and ointment for your eyes, so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. As John is writing uh, both to a literal church that existed in that era in the first century, He's also writing prophetically. The seven churches are seven literal churches, but it also is a prophetic eschatology timeline of the church from the first century right up until the end of time with the rapture as we know it. And when I say end of time, end of the church age or the church period. And he gives us verbiage like be purified and put on white garments. And he gives us writing that puts a highlighter upon the subject of holiness and then ends with that message to the Laodicean church by saying, turn from your indifference. Indifference to what? Well, what is the opposite of holy living? Sinful living. And the Bible warns us in the book of Revelation through final Bible prophecy that we as believers in the last days must be very cautious that we do not become a part of the lukewarm church. If you're taking notes, number one, sin is serious. One of the most important things that I want to teach you today is that in the eyes of God and through a biblical study, you will discover that sin is not indifferent, that in the eyes of God, sin is serious. And so for all of our faithful students that are taking notes, our subject today are my past, present, and future sins already forgiven. Point number one, sin is serious. Sin is an offense to a holy God. Sin does not always break our relationship with Him. I want to say that again. If you're a born-again Christian, you've genuinely repented of sin, you've received Christ into your life, you are following through the biblical principles of discipleship, and you're sincere. I'm not saying that every time you sin or every time you get involved in something that violates the Bible that God throws you out along with your salvation and you are rejected eternally for the judgment of hell. That's not at all what I'm teaching. But what I do want you to understand is even in salvation, by the grace and the mercy of God, sin remains serious. It is an offense to a holy God. And when you live 
in unrepentant sin, it does have the ability to break your fellowship with God. Let me make that point very clear so that you don't misunderstand what I'm teaching. As a believer, when you sin, it does not necessarily break your relationship with God, but unrepentant sin, hear me, unrepentant sin will most definitely break your fellowship with Him. Now, as always, I try to teach as if people who are listening to me just picked up the Bible and are beginning to study it for the first time in their life. It would be a gross error on my part not to explain what sin is. Because if we're going to teach on sin and just leave it to every single individual to fill in the blank as to what they think sin is, we're going to be as confused as perhaps when some of you begin. So in order to avoid sin, it's very important to understand what sin is. So how does the Bible define sin? Perhaps the clearest definition of sin found in the Bible is in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. There the Bible says, sin is the transgression of the law. What law? God's laws, God's standards, God's covenant. Sin is anything that violates the standards of God. The Greek word that, that John used in the Bible for sin is hamartia from the Greek. Not important that you remember that. But hamartia in its root simply means to miss the mark. It's a violation of divine law, both in thought or in action. It is a rebellion or a deviation from that which the Bible teaches is right or righteous. Sin means to reject or even to ignore God's holy standards. Sin is not only missing the mark, it is a defect in our human nature. Now, I want to say this with grace, but so many of the Christian leaders of the modern church and so many politically correct pastors of the modern lukewarm church don't even preach on sin, and I've heard some say are offended by the word sin. There's an old hymn that has a verse in it that says, that saved a wretch like me. That famous hymn known all over the world, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you know in recent years I have preached in churches as a guest evangelist and when they sang Amazing Grace they changed the word wretch and just sang that saved someone like me because the word wretch is offensive, and to many the word sin is offensive. In a major pastor's conference here in the United States of America, last year I heard that one of the keynote speakers teaching all of those pastors that had gathered that God spoke to him never to bring a Bible to church anymore, never put a Bible in the pulpit, never allow a Bible to be seen because the Bible is offensive to the people we're trying to reach. I think most of you that know me well know how I feel about weak preachers and politically correct Christian leaders. I have no tolerance for that type of weakness in my understanding of the Bible. And I'm certainly not trying to be an advocate for those that are overly legalistic. But instead of boldly preaching the standards of the Scripture and risk offending their members, they've replaced the word sin with all kinds of vague terms that carry no conviction. I've heard in my travels, I oftentimes write them down. But instead of using the word sin, I've heard one recently who said, all people have flaws. I heard another person refer to human shortcomings. I heard another say, all of us have baggage and imperfections. 
And I heard one person say, very notable ministry, all of us have made regrettable mistakes along life's journey. But Jesus did not die on the cross and shed his precious blood for your issues or for your baggage or for the regrettable mistakes you've made along life's journey. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the forgiveness of sin. And I want to put a highlighter upon this point because I believe it's foundational to the entire study that we're building on today. Sin in the eyes of God is serious and therefore in your heart and in your eyes sin should be serious as well. I love that passage in 1 Peter, if you want to go there with me, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and go down to verses 13 through 19 there the Bible says, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And so in our study are my past, present, and future sins already forgiven. Point one, sin is serious. I hope I've made that foundation sure. Number two, Christians do not practice sinning. If you study the New Testament, there is one truth that is absolutely consistent, and it's this. Point number two, Christians do not practice sinning. If Christians are taught that all of their sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven, imagine how that affects the mind when you come into a place of weakness or temptation. If you have been taught that you're a Christian and all of your sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven, when you face temptation, when you face flesh, when you face weakness, it would be very easy to think, well, at least I know if I fail, all of my sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven. This false teaching removes the motivation to live a holy life and lessens the seriousness of the penalty of sin. The Bible said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. In James chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible said, Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Sin has a lifespan. The Bible said there's pleasure in sin. Sin will always begin as something alluring, something seductive, something that you feel you have a right to or something that is missing in your heart or missing in your life or missing in your fulfillment. But the Bible says sin comes as pleasure, but it has a lifespan. And James 1.15 says, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Uh, go with me into uh, 1 John 
and the third chapter. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Listen carefully to what the Bible said. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in Him. Anyone who continues to live in Him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning, run a highlighter through that, anyone who keeps on sinning, does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Pause right there. The Bible said, when people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous. It shows they are righteous. It does not make you righteous. Your salvation and your righteousness is through Christ alone. We are not saved by what we do. We are saved and forgiven because of what Christ did. But the Bible is clear. Those who have accepted Christ, the Bible said, people will do what is right. It proves that they are righteousness. That's what the Bible means when it says faith without works is dead. We are not saved. Please hear me. I am not teaching that we are saved by works. We are not. But when you are truly redeemed from the curse of sin and forgiven and the power of salvation becomes a part of the miracle new creation of who you are, The Bible said the evidence will be seen in how you live. Let's read on. Verse 8. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. I want you to run a highlighter through those words, a practice of sinning. I'll come back to that. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them, so they can't keep on sinning because they are the children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers, does not belong to God. This passage that I just read to you, and if time would allow, I could read multiple passages that deal with sin in the New Testament. And when you read all of those passages that deal with sin in the New Testament, and they are properly exegeted, explained, taught, From the original language, they all reveal the same truth. And that biblical truth consistently seen throughout the entirety of the New Testament on the subject of sin is those who are truly born again and have the Spirit of God in them will never be able to make peace with sin nor remain comfortable with sin. Those who belong to God, don't miss this, those who belong to God will always be convicted by and disgusted by the sin that they commit. And they'll be unable to have rest in their spirit until they make peace with God by the repentance and the confession of that sin. Hear me when I tell you, Never settle in your sin. Never accept sin and figure, well, that's just me. I can't help it. Never make sin your annoying friend that you've allowed to move in and take residence in your life. 
because God would never call you to live a holy life without giving you the power to live in victory over sin. Let me say that again. That's so vitally important in this teaching. When God called you as his son or as his daughter to live in victory over sin, he would not instruct you to live in victory over sin if he wouldn't give you the power to do it. That's why the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, But thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, are my past, present, and future sins forgiven? That is the title of our Bible study today. And I want to close by covering carefully through the scripture exactly what the Bible teaches us. Again, number three, are my past, present, and future sins already forgiven? Number one, sin is serious. Number two, Christians do not practice sin. Let me add a little definition to the word practice from the original language. I am not saying that every time you sin that God throws you away. I am not saying that every time you have an impure thought that God discards you. Christians do sin. We should not. We've been instructed not to. But it's one thing to sin and it's another thing to embrace that habit or that sin or that transgression and keep it in your life and accept it and continually practice it. You know, it's, it's one thing. Let me just give you an example. If someone were to steal as a Christian and come under conviction, for the Bible tells us no thief shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And as they read their Bible one day and they're having their devotions, they realize that in a business deal that they actually were dishonest and stole what was not rightfully theirs. And they go to God because they're guilty and they feel conviction. They know that they have transgressed the law. And because of your love for God, you know that things aren't right and you because of your love for God, want to make peace with him. And you go to him and say, God, when I used to be a sinner, I used to do dirty deals like that all the time. And yesterday I slipped up. But as a believer, I'm not going to continue in sin. I confess that to you and ask you to forgive me. Wash me fresh in the blood of Jesus. In that moment, you're forgiven. But if you continue day after day, deal after deal, to continue to lie and to cheat and to steal and to live without integrity and to live with dishonesty in your life, you can be sure that you will not make heaven. I don't know where that line of distinction is. I have studied the Bible for the better part of 50 plus years and it is above my pay grade to tell you where that line of no turning back is. But the Bible tells us that there is a place, Romans chapter 1, where continued sin, the Bible says eventually, God gives us up to reprobate minds. Number three, are my past, present, and future sins forgiven? Uh, let's go into Matthew's Gospel. The very first book of the, of the New Testament and the seventh chapter and go down to verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. The Bible said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name 
and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Wow. This sobering passage refers to a group of people who not only considered themselves to be Christians, they even claimed to operate in apostolic gifts. But on Judgment Day, the Bible said that they will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but will face the judgment of God. Why? The scripture is clear. They did not walk in the will of God, and they lived a life of violating and breaking God's laws. Remember our original definition of sin? Breaking God's laws. Missing the mark. And so it's very sobering, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. There are many people who claim to be Christians, but they practice sin, and they live in sin, and they make excuse for sin. And I fear that on Judgment Day, many, and I'm saying people who may go to church every Sunday of their life, people who pastored churches, people who sang on worship teams, people who taught Sunday school, people who were involved in Christian outreach and missions and feeding the poor, etc., etc. All of the things that you did in the name of Christianity, but in your own heart, you lived and practiced sin. The Bible says, you will hear, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Now, I'm not saying that your salvation, I want to repeat this, I want to make this abundantly clear. I am not saying your salvation depends upon your good works and that you need to live in fear that every time you sin, that God discards you. Because if that were the case, some of you would lose your salvation multiple times a day. For even if your actions are pure, Many times your thoughts are impure. And even if our actions and our thoughts are pure, we still sin because of things not that we've done, but sometimes we sin because of things we have not done. I want to give you a homework assignment because this is a very uh, deep subject that I cannot completely and exhaustively deal with in one Bible setting and in one Bible study. But on our YouTube channel and on our podcast channel, listen to my teaching, Does the Bible Teach Once Saved, Always Saved? And there's more there that you need to hear. Now, those, and again, Many of you, after hearing my teaching, you'll probably be, probably be surprised by many of the notable ministries, major ministries on Christian television, some of the most popular on the internet, who teach that all of your sin, past, present, and future, is already forgiven. And they oftentimes read or quote out of Hebrews chapter 10. If you have your Bible, let me show it to you and then break it down for you. Hebrews chapter 10, go down to verse 16, and I'll read through verse 18. This is a passage that they oftentimes read. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 through 18, the Bible said, This is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And they'll quote that. Did you hear what the Bible said? I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. Verse 18. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifice. And they'll say, is that not sure evidence that the Bible teaches us? that all of our sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven. And they'll oftentimes say things like, Christ paid for the price of sin on the cross from the first sin of Adam until the end of the church age. 
the cross and the blood of Christ covered all sin. And doesn't that sound wonderful? They'll oftentimes say, there is no sin you will ever commit that the blood of Jesus Christ has not already paid for. Does that not equally sound wonderful? But it is not biblical. It sounds good, but it is not biblical. I've heard some of the hyper-grace teachers say this, God doesn't forgive your sin in installments. He paid the debt of your sin once and for all. And again, it sounds so profound. That's right. Jesus didn't pay for my sin in installments. He paid for all of my sin. And it just sounds so profound, but it is not biblical. So are we to believe, as some teach, that God forgives our future sins even before we have committed them? Do you know that that's not taught anywhere in the Bible? And when the Lord says that He forgives us and remembers our sins no more, He's not speaking of your future sins. He's speaking of the sins that we committed before the day of our salvation. When the Lord said, I forgive your sins and will remember your sins no more, He's talking about every sin in your past life when you came to Him and repented of your sin and confessed your sin and trusted in Him. And in His grace for salvation, you can be sure that that is true. At the moment of your salvation, all of your past, will never be remembered against you again. So are we to believe, as some teach, that it doesn't matter whether or not you sin? No, of course not. I mentioned to you that they oftentimes go into Hebrews chapter 10 and they read that passage and say, well, there's evidence that Christ once and for always upon the cross paid the price for all sin. But just go down a couple of more verses. Same chapter. Same chapter, just a few more verses down. Go down to verse 26 in that same chapter and let me read 26 through 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 29. There the Bible says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning... Now notice that the author is talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we've received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. You see, you just can't pull a passage out. You have to read in context, not only of the chapter, but the entire book and the entire Bible. And the Bible repeatedly tells us those who without conviction live in sin, continue in sin, practice sin, will face the judgment of God will not enter heaven, and will one day hear perhaps Him say, as Jesus told us in Matthew's Gospel, Depart from me, you who practice sin, I never knew you. When you repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ and the gift of salvation by faith in God's mercy and grace, you're forgiven from your old sins. And some of you are listening and say, Tiff, I've heard you teach that, but can you clarify that? Is there anything in the Bible that fully supports that? Because I attend a church that preaches all my sins, past, present, and, 
and future are already forgiven her. One of my favorite evangelists or one of my favorite teachers that I listen to, they teach that. And I heard just a day ago, one of the most notable ministries, and I never mention names, I don't think it's necessary at this point, but there was shock that they said, all of your sins, past, present, and future, are already forgiven. So where in the Bible does it say that when you're saved, it refers to your former sins, or it refers to your old sins, not your present sins, not your future sins. Well, go with me. Let's take the time to read it, and you need to highlight this. 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Listen very carefully to what the Bible says. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. Run a highlighter through that. I believe the King James Version, Version says their former sins. Verse 9, forgetting they have been cleansed from their old sins sins. Verse 10, so dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Pause again. Here is the Apostle Peter speaking to believers, speaking to the church, speaking to Christians, and said if you'll take this biblical advice, you will never fall away. Why would the Apostle Peter say that if you'll obey this, you'll never fall away if the opposite of that was not equally true? If you disobey or disregard this warning, you have the potential of falling away. Verse 11, then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we wrap up this Bible study, listen very carefully. There is not one single verse in the entire Bible where God forgave somebody's sins before they committed those sins. Did you hear me? There is not one single story, not one single passage, not one single verse in the entirety of the Bible where God forgave a person's sin before they committed those sins. Every single prayer for forgiveness in the entirety of the Bible reveals people who asked forgiveness for sins they had done. Not one single prayer or word about sins they had not yet done. Every single time in the Bible that God gave forgiveness to a person without exception, it was for sins that that person had already committed not one single time for future sins. Are you listening? Not one single time in the Bible is there a record of future sin in prayer, in confession, or in God's actions for future sins sin. As a child of God, you will always have access to God's pardon for the debt of your sin. Jesus paid for all of our sins when he hung on the cross, but he does not forgive our sins until we come to him confessing our sin and asking for mercy. 1 John chapter 2. I told you we were going to wear your Bible out today. How many times have you heard me say we're going to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible? Today is no different. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. Why throughout the entirety of the New Testament were believers reminded to confess their present sins if all sin had already been forgiven? Will you think about that just for a moment? Why in the New Testament were believers admonished to confess their present sins if all present and future sin had already been forgiven. In the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, and in that prayer he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. In James chapter 5, the Bible said, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. For the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Throughout the New Testament, as Christians, we are admonished to confess our sins. If you sin, if you slip, if you fall, God won't give up on you. It will not break your relationship with God, provided you don't continue to practice that sin with total disregard to the call of righteousness and holiness and works that prove that you are indeed a follower of Christ. Every time you sin, you should immediately run to God. When you receive salvation through Jesus Christ, God's only Son, you're forgiven of every old sin and every former transgression. But as a Christian, when you sin, you will feel a holy disgust and conviction. So now when you confess your sin, you're not praying. Don't miss this. As a Christian, you sin, you fell, you cussed, you did something that violated the truth of God. And you're aware of your sin and you come under conviction and you're, you're, you're not at peace. You're, you're mad at yourself. Why did I do that? I shouldn't live that way as a Christian. That was my old life. I, I, I'm discarded with that but you immediately come to God. You're not confessing your sin to Him as a lost sinner who needs to be saved again and again with every committed sin. Rather, you are coming into the presence of a holy God who loves you and recognizes that your sin, you recognize that your sin is serious and it grieves your heavenly Father. Because you love God and because God loves you, you want peace in your heart. On the day that I was married to my wife Judy, uh, almost 44 years ago, I did not on our wedding day say, listen, throughout the course of our life, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes and I'm going to make you upset and there'll be times you'll be angry with me. And, and, uh, but I just want you to know, I'm never going to apologize. I'm never going to ask for your forgiveness. Uh, we're married now, and uh, you should just accept all of my faults, all of my sins, all of my failures, all of my shortcomings. No, of course not. If you love someone and you're in relationship with someone, proof of the depth and the sincerity of that relationship is when you wrong them, you immediately want peace. You want forgiveness. You want to walk in restored relationship with nothing between your heart and their heart. And so it is with the believer. Real believers, the Bible said, do not practice sin 
do not continue in sin. Paul said, should I continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. But when believers sin, the Bible said if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are all our sins, past, present, and future, already forgiven? That is not a biblical concept. That is not a scriptural teaching. The Bible said at the moment of your salvation, your former life, your former sins are forgiven and buried in the sea of God's forgetfulness. And God calls you now to a, a new life and a life of purity and integrity and holiness. And again, God will not ask you to do what He'll not give you the power to get done. If you have sin in your life and you don't repent of it, you allow that sin to become a seed. And if you don't get rid of the seed of sin, the seed of sin will get rid of you. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Are you living a Christian life? Maybe there are people that are listening to me right now and nobody's ever taken the time to pray with you what many people call the prayer of salvation. Can we do that right now? Wherever you're at. And when you're done praying with me, if you are sincere, will you please take a moment to write in the comments section something like this. Tiff, I prayed that prayer of salvation and I was sincere. Or Tiff, I prayed that salvation prayer today and I meant it. Whatever. Will you take the time to write in the comments and let me know as we review them? Everybody's important to God and you're certainly important to us here at Lost Lamb. And you can go to lostlamb.org. It's on the screen and there are materials and aids to help you as you develop your faith in Christ. But wherever you're at right now, whether you're receiving Christ for the first time or you're away from God or maybe somebody got you into deceptive teaching and you've been comfortable in sin thinking you can live any way you want and the grace of God covers it all. Listen, any teaching on grace that makes you feel comfortable with your sin is heresy. Come to Christ today. Confess your sin. Pray with me right now. Just say, Heavenly Father, Today as I was listening to the Bible, I learned that sin is serious and it separates me from a holy God. And so today, in childlike faith, I repent of my sin and I ask you to forgive me. With the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, cleanse my mind and my body and my spirit and make me holy in your eyes. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me the power to be what you want me to be. Today I receive salvation as the gift of God. And I thank you that I am no longer the property of sin. And the curse of sin in my life is broken. And today I become a child of God. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. To stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus.